Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we'll be getting the webinar started in just a moment. Um, while folks are getting logged in and joining us, I'd love to tell you about some upcoming courses that we have. On Wednesday, June 15th, there will be a free webinar on ergonomics for total worker health. What is the current state of knowledge? And that will be with Katia Costa Black, PhD and PT in the New York, New Jersey Education and Research Center. On Wednesday, June 22nd, we'll also be having another free webinar on protecting essential workers beyond the pandemic. Insights from research and organizing with the California Labor Lab. For more about these events, you can visit us online at coeh at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. And on behalf of education and research centers throughout the country, it is my pleasure to introduce our industrial web hygiene webinar series. This is a collaborative effort on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program and aspires to provide access to current research supported through the NIOSH ERC programs. We appreciate you being here with us today. Today's webinar, Take a Deep Breath, Work-Related Aerosol Respiratory Deposition Study is brought to you by the Southwest Center for Occupational and Environmental Health. A few housekeeping items before we get started. We'll be, you will be muted during the presentation. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A box and we'll save time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as possible. This presentation is also being recorded and will be made available on the COEH YouTube page. All participants who logged in with their registration email for the full live presentation today will also receive an email tomorrow with a link to the evaluation form that will qualify you for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. Once that evaluation is completed, you'll be able to access and print your certificate. And without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome our presenter for today. Dr. Wei Chong Su is an associate professor in the Environmental and Occupational Health Science Program in the Department of Epidemiology, Human Genetics, and Environmental Sciences at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, so known as UT Health. He's also a faculty member at the Southwest Center for Occupational and Environmental Health. Dr. Su teaches several industrial hygiene core courses at UT Health, and his research interests are centered on aerosol-related environmental and occupational health issues with a focus on aerosol respiratory de deposition. Dr. Su is a certified industrial hygienist and a past chair of the Aerosol Technology Committee in the American Industrial Hygiene Association. He received his PhD from the School of Public Health, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Thank you so much for being here. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, maybe, um, okay, you mute yourself. Yeah, I, I, I heard <laughs> the wind blowing. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for the uh, introduction. And uh, I would like to say it's really my pleasure to have this opportunity to share with you my research on aerosol respiratory deposition. And uh, for this presentation, uh, what I'm going to talk is all about my past, current, and future studies. Um, I'm not going to talk about someone else's work. And I guess you are all here is because that you're more interested in my stuff, right? So uh, in the next 40 minutes, uh, if you can bear with me for my Chinglish, my uh, Chinese English, and to pay more attention on my slides, not on your uh, email or iPhone. And uh, I guarantee that you will learn something interesting today. Aerosol uh, is, uh, is defined as the solid or liquid particles suspended in the air. Aerosol is also called airborne particulate matter. We all know workplace aerosol has been and continues to be an important occupational health concern. Aerosol generated in the workplace could be uh, large particles like the wood dust and the coal mine dust here. Uh, they always make the workplace a mess. But some workplace aerosol are very little tiny. Uh, it is impossible for you to see them with your bare eyes. You can only find them under an optical or electronic microscope. 
and then most of these small particles are very toxic. Aerosol in the workplace inevitably could be inhaled by workers. The inhalation and the consequent deposition of aerosol in workers' lung could induce a diverse health effect. So from the occupational health point of view, it is important to study aerosol respiratory deposition so we can more correctly estimate workers' inhalation dose caused by the exposure to certain toxic aerosol in the workplace. In our respiratory system, there are two major sections. The upper airways include the oral airway, nasal airway, throat, and part of the trachea bronchial airways, TB airways. The lower airways covers most of the part of the TB airways and the alveoli region. I believe you all know the primary work of the alveoli is to do, is to do the air exchange. And that's also the only function of the lung. So the job for all the other airways, like the nasal, oral, and the trichobronchial airways, their jobs are just to transport the inhaled air from the nose or mouth all the way down to the alveoli for air exchange. So if the inhaled air contains aerosol, while the particle traveling down to the alveoli, they could deposit somewhere in the airway because of one of the deposition mechanism shown here. Uh, this is the Adian's head found in 1947 Roswell incident in New Mexico when the FBI found the UFO crashed there. No, just kidding. Uh, this is a MRI scan of a human head. The nasal airway is over here. And these are the cross-sectional areas around, along the nasal airway. The number shown under each cross-sectional area are the distance from the nose tip to the location of that cross-sectional area. You can see the nasal airway here is in the terminate region is very, very complicated and distorted. And uh, it is this distorted nasal airway helps to efficiently warm and humidify the air passing through the nasal airway to condition the inhale air good for our lung. And you also can see the inhaled air make a 90 degree sharp turn after entering the nasal airway from the vertical to horizontal direction in the nasal vestibule. This is a, a MRI scan of the oral airway. You can see the structure of the oral airway is much simpler. Similarly, after entering the mouth, the inhaled air makes a sharp 90 degree turn in the oral pharynx from the horizontal to vertical, and then further transit down to the larynx and the trachea. Our long airway is built by many, many Y-shaped tubes. We call each Y-shaped tube a lung generation or a lung bifurcation. So you know the largest bifurcation in a lung is constructed by the trachea and the two main bronchi. And that's the first lung generation. The last lung generation in the lung is the 15th or the 16th lung generation. The projected area of our lung is about the size of a piece of paper, about one square foot. Not a big deal, right? But the total inner surface of our lung can reach to 1,500 square feet. That's about the size of a half tennis court. 
So the projected area of our lung to its total inner surface area is just like a piece of paper in the half tennis court. And uh, in this picture, the wet tennis court here represent the fact that the inside surface of our lung airways is fully covered by a thin layer of mucus. So when the aerosol travels in the airways and the touch the wall of the airway, it will deposit and stay there. There is no way for the deposit aerosol to resuspend in the airway. So based on this, when a worker inhales a group of aerosols with different particle sizes, for those big particles with diameters larger than say one micrometer, their primary deposition mechanism are inertia impaction. These large particles will easily deposit in the upper airways like in the nasal airway and uh, in the oral airway or around the throat because of their heavy mass. On the other hand, for small particles with diameter less than 0.1 micrometer, their primary deposition mechanism will be Brownian diffusion. These small aerosols could deposit in anywhere in the respiratory tract that the air carries them to, but most of the small particles will end up in the alveolar region because like I just tell you, there is a huge surface area for in the alveoli for them to deposit. Here, listen, these aerosol respiratory deposition predictions are all based on standard spherical particles. So how about the respiratory deposition for those real workplace aerosol? like those uh, fiber and the welding film, they have irregular shapes. Their shapes is not standard spherical uh, a particle. They have irregular shape. To answer these questions, I devoted most of my research life on studying it. In my previous lab, Bob Lace, we had a unique facility and the special tools to study the aerosol respiratory deposition for particles with irregular shapes. Briefly speaking, we used realistic human airway replicas as the experimental tool to carry out aerosol respiratory deposition experiment. We had a nasal airway replica, which was made based on a set of MRI scans of a adult head, like the alien's head I just showed you. Uh, this nasal airway replica is constructed by 77 acrylic plates, and each plate is 1.5 millimeter in thickness. This nasal airway replica keeps all the dedicated nasal airway structures from the vestibule, nasal valve, turbinate, nasal pharynx. We have used this nasal airway replica for many, many nasal deposition studies. In our lab, we also had human oral airway replicas and the TB airway replicas. The, the original production modes for, this, uh, for making these airway replicas were all made by donated cadavers, dead bodies. This is the procedure of making human oral airway and the trichobronchial airway replicas from the production mode using conductive rubber material. I can tell you, uh, this procedure is an old, traditional, time-consuming, labor-intensive method to make realistic human airway replica. But it is the only available way in the past to make human airway replicas. So once I have the oral airway replica and have a long airway replica, then 
I have a human oral too long airway replica from the mouth, oral pharynx, larynx, glottis opening, trachea, and the part of the tracheobronchial airways down to the first lung generation. And this oral too long airway replica is located around here in the human respiratory tract. So once I have the realistic human airway replica, I can blow all kinds of test aerosol into the airway replica to do the aerosol respiratory deposition study. If the aerosol delivered into the airway replica is good aerosol, like drug aerosol, then it's called drug delivery study. So you can know why it is called occupational health study. It is because the aerosol used in those uh, studies are all the nasty workplace aerosol. But the occupational health study was the one we were more interest, interested in because if the government aid, funding agency also think it is important, then we got big bucks. We had a NIOSH research grant in the past to study the respiratory deposition of man-made fibers like carbon fibers, titanium dioxide fibers, and the glass fiber. Here you can see the morphology of the fiber is quite different from the spherical particles. So we wanted to know if their respiratory deposition is also different from the spherical particles. We use different methods to aerosolize the fiber material depending on the characteristics of the fiber. The fiber aerosol were then directly delivered into the airway replica for the deposition experiment. Before the deposition experiment, the inner surface of each airway replica we used was coated with a thin layer of silicon oil to mimic the wet surface nature in the real human airway. And then we only use the inspiratory flow rate, inhalation only for the deposition experiment. The flow rate ranged from 15 liter per minute to six, 60 liter per minute, representing workers under different workloads. After the deposition experiment, the airway replica was, were separated or cut into several segments based on the human airway structure. Then each airway segment was washed by alcohol to recover the deposit fibers. And then the wash solutions with recovered fibers were used to make microscope slides. Then we used an optical microscope to count the fiber number, measure the fiber length and the fiber diameter for every single fiber shown under the microscope slide, one by one. I can tell you uh, this was a tedious and the boring work. And the worst thing is it hurt my eyes badly back in those days. But it was it when the payback time came. This is the fiber deposition fraction in the nasal airway by different fiber materials, different lens categories, and the different inspiratory flow rate used in the deposition experiment. You can see the fiber deposition in the nasal airway basically increase proportionally with the inspiratory flow rate and the fiber lens. And uh, the deposition hotspot in the nasal airway is around the anterior region. This is because fibers with high inertia will have difficulty to pass through the 90 degree sharp turn from vertical to horizontal in the nasal anterior region. So most of the large, long and the heavy fibers deposit in the anterior region because of the impaction 
the position. Similarly, high fiber inertia will cause more fiber deposition around the oropharynx. In the trichobronchial airways, the deposition hotspot is around the carina of each lung bifurcation. Here, the oropharynx and the carina are both the locations in the human airways that have sudden airflow direction change. So fiber deposit, deposit there are again because of inertia impaction. This figure shows you the fiber deposition efficiency in the head airways plus against the impaction parameter comparing with standard spherical particles. You can see here, impaction is the dominant deposition mechanism for aerosol deposition in the head airways for both fiber and the spherical particles. And the fiber deposition efficiency is shown to be less than the spherical particles. When plot all the data, the nasal and oral data together on the same graph, you can see the nasal deposition efficiency is much higher than the oral deposition efficiency. Here, a high aerosol deposition efficiency indicates a low aerosol penetration rate. So you can see this result implies that our nose is a much better filter comparing to our mouth for protecting our lung. So if you are a habitual mouth breather, you're basically having a wide open safety gate to allow everything bad in the air to easily enter into your lung. So uh, better to change the habit of mouth breathing. This figure shows you the fiber deposition efficiency in the trigger bronchial airways as a function of Stokes number. The Stokes number is another aerosol inertia index. Uh, you can see from the first lung generation to the fourth lung generation, again, the fiber deposition efficiency increase when the fiber inertia increase. And the fiber deposition efficiency is generally less than the spherical particles. The lower fiber deposition efficiency comparing to the spherical particle implies that fiber can travel relatively easier than the spherical particles in the human airways. That means fiber can also reach the deep lung relatively easier. If fiber deposit in the deep lung, like in the alveoli, it would cause severe lung problem. Then years later, we got another research project because of the hot issue at that time, nanomaterials. Today, nanomaterials seems not a hot issue anymore. We all know carbon nanotubes have a unique structure. Uh, they, their tube diameter are less than 100 nanometer by definition, but their tube dense could be hundreds to millions times bigger than their tube diameter. The toxicity of carbon nanotubes has been a very serious concern to the government because many animal exposure studies have shown that the carbon nanotubes can cause similar biological outcomes as asbestos. Therefore, there is a need to study the deposition of carbon nanotubes in human airways for related workers. But the problem is the carbon nanotube aerosol are in the nanoscale. It is impossible for me to use the uh, optical microscope to measure and count every single carbon nanotubes. Uh, if someone dared to do that, that poor guy could easily get blind in just a week. 
So I figured out a special exper experimental approach to use size classified carbon nanotubes and uh, nanoparticle sizer to indirectly estimate the carbon nanotube deposition in human airways. There were four carbon nanotube materials were used in the deposition study. They were stack cup carbon nanotubes, single walled carbon nanotubes, multi walled carbon nanotubes, and the graphene. And uh, for different carbon nanotube materials, I use different generation methods to aerosolize carbon nanotube materials. As I mentioned, I have to use size classified carbon nanotube aerosol to do deposition experiment. So for this reason, an aerosol classifier, DMA was used to classify carbon nanotube aerosol by size. And the classification diameter used were 50 nanometer, 100 nanometer, and the 200 nanometer. You can see here, carbon nanotube aerosol could be successively size classified. I got nice concentration peaks right on those classification diameters I pre-selected. To further understand the physical characteristics of the carbon nanotube aerosol, the size classified carbon nanotube aerosol were delivered to other aerosols instrument, like the electrostatic precipitator is for collecting carbon nanotube samples for morphology analysis, and the aerosol particle mass analyzer is for acquiring the aerodynamic diameter of the carbon nanotubes. And this table shows you the result of aerodynamic diameter obtained from the size classified carbon nanotubes. You can see the aerodynamic diameter of the carbon nanotubes are generally less than their classification diameters. And this result implies that carbon nanotube aerosol has a loose structure. Their structure is very loose. And it was also proved by our uh, TEM morphology analysis. I will show you in just a second. For the carbon nanotube morphology analysis, you can see uh, even though the carbon nanotube aerosol were size classified, they still can have all kinds of shapes. They could be the tangle tube, curved tube, round tube, rope-like tube, or bird nest-like tube. All kinds of shapes you can imagine. And you also can see that their physical dimension are much, much larger than their classification diameter. You can see this little tiny reference bar here. Uh, you probably cannot see very clearly. This bar is 100 nanometer. So if you have time and got a little bit patient, you can draw anything, anything you like by using those uh, carbon nanotube T and pictures. For the carbon nanotube nasal deposition experiment, I use a freeway valve to connect the particle sizer to the inlet and outlet of the nasal airway for measuring the concentration of the size classified carbon nanotubes before and after they passing through the nasal airway. In this way, I can obtain the penetration ratio and uh, then calculate the carbon nanotube deposition efficiency in the airway. The carbon nanotube nasal deposition acquired were all generally low. And uh, when the inspiratory flow rate increased, the deposition efficiency decreased. This result is opposite to the main-made fiber result. 
when plot the carbon nanotube data together with those large fibers data, you can see uh, there seems a smooth connection uh, between the different experimental data sets from the very large carbon fiber to the very small carbon nanotubes. And the deposition efficiency of the carbon nanotubes in the nasal airway are generally less than 0.1. This implies that more than 90% of the inhaled carbon nanotubes will penetrate through the nasal airway to enter the lower airways. This is the experimental setup for the oral two long airway deposition study. The same experimental method was used, just a little bit complicated. Uh, the concentration of the size classified carbon nanotube has to be measured at the oral inlet and also at each long tube outlet. Again, it's a little bit complicated and a bit tricky to estimate the carbon nanotube deposition in the lung bifurcation, but you don't want me to tell you the details because I guarantee that you will fall asleep in just a minute. But just trust me here, this method works. To use this experimental method, I have to modify the airway replica. These figures shows you all the modified airway replica I made for this study. By using these modified airway replicas, uh, the needed carbon nanotube concentration measurement at different long tube outlets can be done without a problem. This slide shows you all the deposition results I got for carbon nanotube airway deposition. You can see very few carbon nanotube deposition were found in the oral to long airway replica. The deposition fraction for most of the airway section were less than 4%, and the no clear deposition pattern were, could be identified because the, the deposition fractions were all small and uh, fluctuated. Again, when plot the carbon nanotube data together with all the other large fiber data on the same graph, the latter U-like deposition pattern shows again and uh, connect different data set from the large fiber, medium fiber to small carbon nanotubes. This latter U-like airway deposition pattern indicates that Brownian diffusion is the dominant deposition mechanism for carbon nanotubes, respiratory deposition. So for the summary of the past, basically the realistic human airway replica is very useful and uh, the dominant deposition mechanism for those main made large fibers is impaction and the major deposition mechanism for carbon nanotubes is diffusion. And uh, I believe you all can easily identify the weakness of my past studies. That's the airway replica used in the past was only limited to the human upper airways. And we all know the most of the severe occupational lung disease are not up here. So we really need a lower airway replica to study the aerosol deposition in the deep lung. Since the aerosol respiratory deposition in the lower airway is such important so far, so, so after I moved to UT Health in 2016, I collaborated with some researchers, uh, tried to make a human lower airway replica. Then, voila, I got a trickle bronchial airway, TB airway replica down to the 11th long generation. And there are more than 1,000 long tube outlets 
on the on this TV airway replica. Thanks to the new technology, uh, now the airway replicas like the oral airway replica, nasal airway replica, and the that complicated trichobronchial airway replica can all be made by 3D printing. To well apply that complicated TB airway replica for aerosol respiratory deposition experiment, I developed a MELDA. MELDA. The MELDA stands for Mobile Aerosol Lung Deposition Apparatus. MELDA has two major systems. The human airway system and the aerosol measurement system. And I put everything on the lab car, which makes the aerosol respiratory deposition experiment mobile. And the, and the aerosol deposition experiment is no longer be limited in the laboratory. For the human airway system, the oral airway and the trichobronchial airways are connected and the trichobronchial airway replica is placed inside a container. And then there are totally 12 air outlets on the lung container. And uh, this design is to try to e evenly pull out the air from the lung container in all directions. For the first version of the human airway system, there was no nasal airway and no alveolar region. The aerosol measurement system has two particle sizer to measure the particle size distribution before and after the aerosol passing through a specific airway section to calculate the aerosol deposition fraction in that airway section. Because the current focus is on the ultra fine particles. So the particle sizer currently used is SMPS. They could be the green SMPS plus C, TSI nanoscan SMPS, or TSI SMPS. To acquire the ultrafine particle deposition in individual long generations, I made different sets of T trichobronchial airway replicas that have in different long generations. So by changing the trichobronchial airways inside the lung container and then measuring the outlet to inlet concentration ratios by particle sizer for each airway replica, I can then calculate the uh, size dependent ultrafine respiratory deposition for individual lung generation based on this equation. The result obtained from the MELDA performance evaluation test using uh, sodium chloride ultrafine particles showed that the concentration ratio measured decreased by how many long generations are on the airway replica. And the ultrafine particle deposition in each long generations was generally less than 6%. Here, I would like to say for this kind of experimental data set, it could take me weeks to acquire this data using the traditional experimental method. But it only took my student about a couple of hours to collect all these data using the MELDA approach. We have applied this MELDA approach for a welding film respiratory deposition study you can see a portion of the welding film particles is in the ultrafine particle region. And the uh, welding film particles are aggregates uh, with irregular shapes. For the welding film study, we developed an empirical model as a function of the particle size and the air, airway replica number to predict 
the outlet to inlet concentration ratio, and then use that empirical model to estimate the welding film respiratory deposition. You can see the ultrafine particle, ultrafine welding film showed a relatively higher respiratory deposition in the trichobronchial airways. And this might be caused by the irregular shape of the welding film particles. And then we also applied the MELDA approach in the 3D printing emission study. We used uh, ABS as the 3D printing material. You can see the 3D printing particles are basically spherical particles. And uh, they are all ultrafine particles, less than 100 nanometer. And then we used a similar way to estimate the respiratory deposition of 3D printing emission in the trichobronchial airways and found the deposition of 3D printing particles are slightly lower than the conventional deposition curve. Later, the function of the MELDA got improved by installing a nasal airway and uh, a representative alveolar section. The alveolar section is made of forms with very fine pore size. And it just, it just like the real alveolar. Based on this upgrade, the MELDA now can efficiently obtain the size dependent aerosol respiratory deposition data for the three major human airway regions. They are head airways, the entire TB airways, and the alveolar region. So with this upgrade, no need to swap the airway replica from one to 11 during the experiment anymore. This slide shows you by using the two SMPs to measure the particle size distribution at the four different locations on the MELDA, the respiratory deposition fraction in the three major human airway regions can be calculated. The performance evaluation of this uh, upgrade MELDA was done by using, again, the ultrafine sodium chloride particles. And the result showed it that the respiratory deposition data agreed quite well with the conventional long deposition curves. So far, the upgrade MELDA has been used in the real life setting for providing preliminary data for passive vaping related e-cigarette aerosol study. And you can see for the secondhand vaping exposure, the e-cigarette aerosol is mainly ultrafine particles. And the size dependent respiratory deposition acquired in the trichobronchial region and the alveolar sections were found to close to the conventional deposition curves. By using the Moody to collect size-dependent e-cigarette aerosol samples and then conducting GCMS chemical analysis for those samples, we can know the chemical composition in those size-dependent e-cigarette aerosol. Based on the acquired size-dependent aerosol deposition fraction and the size-dependent chemical composition, I can then calculate the deposit dose of a certain e-cigarette chemical in the passive vapor's lung. Currently, the MELDA is used for outdoor ultrafine particle research to study aerosol respiratory deposition caused by exposure to ambient ultrafine particles. And these are some initial results obtained so far. Similarly, by having the size-dependent respiratory deposition data and the size-dependent chemical composition data, I can estimate the deposit dose of some hazardous metals contained in the ambient ultrafine particles. And the, those uh, metals in the ultrafine particles 
are all generated by the traffic or the industry. The metal analysis was done by ICP MS. So based on what I have shown you for my current studies, we know uh, MELDA is a useful tool to efficiently obtain on-site respiratory deposition data. And with the help of the laboratory chemical analysis, the deposit dose of a certain toxic substance contained in the ultrafine particles can be estimated. So for my future study on e-cigarette aerosol, we will recruit pairs of active and passive vapors who live together and bring MELDA to their home to collect real life data under realistic passive vaping scenarios. And the MELDA will be placed at those locations where the passive vapors usually are when the active vapors are vaping. Then use both the real life and the laboratory data to estimate not only the deposit dose, but also the health risk caused by passive vaping. We will estimate both the non-cancer risk and also the cancer risk. And also in the future, I will keep upgrading the overall function of the MELDA. For example, uh, I will try to design the temperature and the humidity conditioner for MELDA to change the condition of the air before the air entering the MELDA to mimic, uh, to mimic the function of the nose. Also, maybe I have the MELDA to wear some personal ultrafine particle samplers for collecting the on-site particle uh, samples. And uh, I would modify the MELDA to make it feasible for large particles, for those particles in micron size. So for this, I definitely need a big grant, uh, big enough for me to buy two TSI APS for my MELDA. So these are the reference shown uh, on my slides. And uh, that's all I have. I uh, hope you have learned something interesting today and uh, thank you for your attention. Wow, thank you so much for, for this presentation. I'm sure I am not alone in stating just how incredibly impressive your research is. So thank you so much for being here and sharing it with us today. Um, I don't know if you see the reactions coming through. We've got some claps and thumbs up. Um, at this time, if you have any questions for our presenter, please do feel free to enter them into the online chat or the online Q&A. Um, and it was fun to see some of these questions were getting answered live time. <laughs> so I'll, I'll do my best to, to pick out some that um, I don't know if we've answered quite yet. Um, first is how would ENT surgery, such as a nasal turbinectomy, affect the nasal deposition pattern? Is that something you're able to answer? Sorry, uh, can you repeat that? Oh, sure. I, I, I can hear very clearly. Oh, um, is this any better if I hold the microphone here? Yes, no, okay. maybe? <laughs> okay. Um, how would ENT surgery, such as a nasal turbinectomy, affect the nasal deposition pattern? Oh, uh, uh, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe no worries. I, uh, I need that uh, after surgery, uh, nasal airway replica. Uh, available then when once I have that after surgery nasal airway replica uh, available I can conduct this similar uh, deposition experiment and uh, compare the data with the normal ones then I can uh, tell you uh, how the na nasal surgery will affect the uh, aerosol nasal deposition yeah Thank you very much. Um, another question, and also thank you for sharing all of the different um, 
techniques or different exposures that you have looked at this technique for. Um, we have some follow-up questions specific to the 3D printer types. Um, have you considered testing deposition of different 3D printer extruder materials and 3D printer types? For example, other thermoplastic printers and metallic printers. Uh, no, I haven't had a chance to uh, test uh, the I believe that's something to do with the roughness of the uh, inner surface of the airway replica. So maybe uh, by using different material or different three D printing technology, that will make the uh, that will make rough or smooth for the uh, airway model. Um, no. Uh, because for that complicated TB air, airway uh, replica I show you, I only found one machine. That one probably million dollars commercial 3D printer can make that complicated TB airways. And uh, by using one specific material, it's called like, it's called liquid ABS, something like that, and uh, I, uh, we haven't had a chance to use some other uh, 3D printer or some other uh, 3D printer to make the same uh, TB, TB, TB airways, and I don't have uh, that much funding for that because one, that TB airways down to the 11 takes like three days for the 3D printer to print and it cost me like almost $2,000. So I, yeah, that's uh, maybe it. in the future, in the near future, probably when the 3D printer are more uh, popular and uh, the, the printing prices get dropped, then I might have to, I might be able to uh, compare different um, uh, compare the deposition from different uh, 3D printing materials. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we also have a couple of questions of whether or not you've been able to look at the deposition of silica fibers and particulates or silica dust deposition. Uh, I, I, I haven't tried that yet. I haven't tried that yet. It, it, it could be in the future work. Yes. Yeah. I haven't. Uh, it, 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 it all it, it all related, it all depends on the, the research grant, right? If the research grant for, uh, is for a carbon fiber, titanium dax fiber, glass fiber, carbon nanotube, I do those experiments. But uh, so far we haven't had a, a grant, research grant for silica fiber, uh, silica dust. Maybe that's the, uh, one of the future work, yes. Thank you so much. Um, can you also share what is the definition of aerodynamic diameter? Aerodynamic diameter is the, uh, is, a, is a particle diameter uh, that can allow uh, uh, researcher to compare with different uh, the, the behavior of different particle uh, material. For, uh, uh, for example, if, if I want to compare the water droplet or compare uh, by comparing to what water droplet to the fiber, then we can compare, we can, cannot compare based on their physical dimension because the fiber and the spherical water droplet are different. So by using the aerodynamic diameter, they use the water density as the reference, then it will be able to compare all different uh, aerosol in different shape or different uh, material and uh, to know which one is uh, bigger or smaller, what is their behavior in the air look like. So aerodynamic diameter is a special term 
uh, that's the the aerosol sci scientists scientists usually use that aerodynamic diameter to compare with different particle with different shape and uh, material. That's Thank the you. index, the uh, aerosol index. Thank you so much for sharing that definition. Um, we also have a comment and a follow up question. Um, so I'll read the comment first. Well, hopefully I'll get the pronunciation correct here. <laughs> um, thanks for mentioning the role of the nose in air conditioning, heating and humidification, as well as particle filtration by impaction. You might also consider adding enrichment of inspired air with biogenic NO from the nasal mucosa and paranasal sinuses, since NO enhances mucolysary function and produces bacteriostasis and pulmonary vasodilation. So that was the first part. And then the follow-up question is, have you considered collaborating with a bioengineer utilizing computational fluid dynamic tools to attempt to model your results? Yeah, I, ha I have been waiting for uh, some uh, uh, CFD researcher to uh, collaborate uh, together for years. Nobody call me so uh but i present my experiment in different uh, academic uh conference but uh based on what i know the the, the cfd researcher they just want to do the uh simulation they don't um maybe they just could uh, but well uh yeah that, that 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 will be good. That will be great because the experimental data usually can validate their simulation. But the, so far, I haven't had a chance to uh, work together with the CFD uh, long deposition researcher for for a research grant. Maybe. Hopefully in the near future, we can work together and uh, have some fancy grant. And uh, I, I, I believe that would be good for both sides, yeah. Great, so if anyone watching this video knows of someone or is someone, there is an open invitation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we also have another question. Um, do you continue to coat the airway with oil with the new model? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for the for Melda, we it's not easy to uh, recode it, but we still uh, routinely try to uh, apply the silicon oil in inside the inner surface of the uh, Melda airway. But for those past experiment, um, we code it very often because that airway replica is relatively simpler, so easy to code, yeah. Thank you. Um, and can you also speak to the high simulated air rates that you chose to use for your experiments? And this person noted a respiratory rate of 35 to 40 L per minute is not physiological for humans. So what, well, what went into your decisions there? Okay, so here, like I mentioned, I only use inspiratory flow rate, right? Just, just uh, inhale only. If you consider the human breath, that's the half of the time is inhale and half of the time is exhale. So if you want to do it all inspiratory inhale only, you got to double the flow rate. So that's why my, so my 60 liter per minute is actually is, 30 liter per minute for the for respiratory uh, point of view. So for inspiratory point of view, it's on you, you got to double the flow rate. Thank you so much. Um, and it looks like we have time for one more question here. Um, does the real inhalation mechanism affect the results? Also, the real airway materials. It, the answer is probably, but I don't think that will make a big difference because uh, because for 
uh, especially for large particles, the deposition uh, usually happen only when you inhale. Uh, uh, usually happen when inhalation during the in inhalation that deposition uh, happen. But for uh, small particles, probably part of the deposition will happen during the exhalation. So um, I haven't had a chance to test, uh, but, but I remember there was a paper published. Um, deposition also happened during the exhal exhalation, but I believe the portion is not that big. Well, thank you so, so much for your time today, for sharing your research with us, and to all of our learners who, who logged in for today's webinar. Um, we will be sending out a link to the evaluation. I've also placed it in the chat if anyone wants to go ahead and complete the evaluation now for that certificate of completion. Um, and be sure to check out our upcoming events. And for more information, you can look at coeh at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. And we'll also send out an email with a link to this presentation recording um, within in about 24 hours from now. So thank you so much, Dr. Sue, for joining us and for sharing. We appreciate you being here. My pleasure. Goodbye, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.